Okay. Do, do we want to start, everyone? If we do, I was in a panel here this morning, and it was really hard to hear. It's going to be really hard to hear now, too. So we're all going to talk as loud as we can. Can you all hear me now? Can you hear me? Because I'm getting competition from the next room here. Okay, what we decided to do, because this is the afternoon and we've had such a very good day, is to try to be as interactive as we can. And that means that we're going to have a conversation up here, and we'd like to have a conversation with you. But first, we thought you might like to know who we all are. So we thought we'd just introduce ourselves. I am Barbara Judge. I'm only letting people have one sentence, so I'm going to run my sentence for a while. In my youth, I was a commissioner of the Securities and Exchange Commission in America. More recently, I was chairman of the UK Atomic Energy Authority in Britain. And currently, I'm chairman of the UK Pension Protection Fund. All of those jobs are government jobs. I have, however, been in the private sector from time to time. On my left. Uh, my name is Henry Ritchie. I'm a partner at... Is that better? Uh, good. Uh, my name is Henry Ritchie. Thank you. Uh, I'm a partner at McKinsey & Company based in Rio de Janeiro. I'm originally from New Zealand. Um, and I have uh, worked in Latin America running a construction company before going uh, to business school in the United States. I run our infrastructure practice uh, and have spent a lot of time working uh, with cities uh, on how they can deliver more infrastructure and operate it better. Okay. My name is Wilson Point. My name is Wilson Point. I am an electrical engineer and uh, entrepreneur all my life. Until last year, I was the president of Point Energia, a company of power rental. I sold my company one year ago, and uh, now, with 54 years old, I had accepted the invitation of the mayor of Sao Paulo to to have a new experience in public sector like a president of Sao Paulo business a new company that will will have the mission of uh, uh, improve the environment of business and make PPPs in Sao Paulo hello good afternoon everyone uh, oh you can hear me my name is Abel Ang uh, I'm the Chief Executive Officer of a company called Economic Development Innovations Singapore. And uh, what we essentially do is uh, we are in the business of building and developing cities uh, around the world. Uh, we have a track record of uh, 15 greenfield cities that we've developed in Asia. Uh, all of them done profitably, varying sizes between 30 hectares to uh, 80 square kilometers. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have a specific interest in Latin America now, and uh, that's the reason why we are at this summit. Good evening. I'm Hardik Bhatt. I'm a director with Cisco's uh, Smart and Connected Communities. Uh, I look after implementing solutions for public sector and also looking at various business models uh, between public sector and private sector. Previous to joining Cisco, I was the CIO, Chief Information Officer for the City of Chicago under Mayor Daly. And there are two, play two times when I am very delighted about me being short. One is on the airplanes, two is in this chair. This is very nice. And to Henry, I'm a big fan of New Zealand rugby and cricket teams. Perfect. Okay, well, I was going to start out this panel just by talking about the fact that things change. When I lived in America in 1975, New York was the pits. It was a terrible, awful place to live. It was dirty. It was ugly. It was crime-ridden. I was mugged twice. In actual fact, people were moving and government and companies were moving out of the city to Connecticut because the tax structure was more favorable in Connecticut. 
the government didn't seem to care about the fact that the city was decaying. If you go back to New York City now, it's lovely. If you look around Grand Central Station, which used to be a very dangerous place, the Grand Central Partnership has cleaned it up. If you look around 42nd Street, which was where the theaters were, you never wanted to go to the theater because you couldn't get home at night because if you got in a taxi, you were likely to get mugged. Today, you could walk home. What has happened in a place like New York from 1975 to now? A lot of it has been a confluence of public-private partner partnerships, good policing, but strong leadership at the head. My second experience is when I was in university in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, if you went to the University of Pennsylvania was a slum. You were afraid to walk home from the library to your dorm because you might get mugged. You couldn't go down to the historic harbor because it was dirty and ugly and dangerous. Today the harbor is called Society Hill and University of Pennsylvania has bought up all the lands around it and redone done the city by collaborating with the real estate people around the university. One smart thing that they did in Philadelphia in Society Hill at the harbor was they had a lot of old houses, old townhouses which were dilapidated and the government got together, the local city government, and essentially gave the houses away if you promised, you paid $5 for your house, but you had to promise to pay $50,000 to fix it up to a certain standard. Today, none of us could afford to live in those houses. They're so lovely. So there are ways that cities can work together with the private sector and everybody makes money. And this is supposed to be a business section, so we're going to talk about what we can do now to make cities better places to live and to make it profitable to do so. In actual fact, doing well by doing good. So I'm going to ask the panel some questions, but we want everyone to, to discuss those questions, not just to have performances one after the other. So my first question, if you will, is... Okay, my first question is actually, is actually to Abel, but to everybody. How do we make money? Three questions, Abel and everyone. Talk about PP, PPPs. Why do they have such a bad name? Maybe that's Henry. Talk about, really, how do we make jobs? How do, for Wilson, really, how do we make jobs, cities make jobs? How do we make it more profitable for cities to bring in people to make, to instill more jobs in the system? And then how do we make it pay? And then what do we do in terms of governments helping older people? That's where we're going to start. So we'll start here with PPPs. <clears throat> Is the microphone on? Good. Um, in our last session, I think we had a very interesting uh, input on the financial challenges in meeting uh, the demands of delivering city services. Uh, clearly, PPPs are going to play a key role in that. Uh, but as Maybe you better explain to everybody. Does everyone know what a PPP is? Everyone knows. Let me, let me explain. I mean, uh, a public-private partnership is the, uh, and the acronym PPP. Uh, and as it would suggest, it's a partnership between the public sector, in this case we'll talk about cities, uh, and various uh, private sector players. PPPs have got a bit of a bad name in some areas. There have been great examples of PPPs, and I'll highlight right from the start probably the poster child for PPP of the London uh, uh, Dock Rail, Dockland Rail, where uh, you know, the, the uh, private sector came in and uh, helped create a, a rail line that has led to quite dramatic uh, uh, regeneration of a key part of London. And, and there are some key things I'd just like to talk about perhaps in the next you know, three or four minutes and sort of lessons uh, and, and how cities and the private sector can structure things properly to, to make money and deliver social good and, and services uh, to citizens. There are a few things I just want to uh, raise. First of all, uh, it is very important in your PPP planning 
and this is something that Wilson will be thinking through a lot now in his role in Sao Paulo, uh, to think quite broadly about the potential for PPPs. Uh, in, in a lot of areas, uh, PPPs have been applied to uh, quite a narrow set of, uh, of opportunities. Uh, we heard in th this morning's first session that we need the private sector to help solve some of the biggest city problems. And uh, when we think of the potential and the creativity that sits in the private sector, the city to think broadly about the potential that exists in a lot of, uh, of its uh, service areas, and then to get input from the private sector in a deliberate fashion. So I would highlight here that uh, for those of you that are not familiar with the current infrastructure development plans in Colombia, uh, where the uh, law, and, and, and now again in, uh, in Mexico, where the, uh, the private initiative law is starting to help the public sector think through uh, what are potential opportunities uh, to improve city service, uh, improve infrastructure, and therefore get the private sector engaged. Once you work through what this pipeline of projects looks like, then the city really needs to prioritise these opportunities. It needs to really believe that the private sector can deliver services at a lower cost. What happens all too often, and one of the main problems, is that the cities get into a, a crunch on funding and look to PPPs as a solution uh, in a short-term fashion. That is a mistake and needs to be avoided. Once you decide where your priorities sit, it's very important um, uh, to set up a process and set a vision for what this looks like. You need to set clear objectives, clear performance goals and key, key performance indicators, and not just from an economic perspective. The economics need to add up, but so do the social benefits um, and so do the improvement in services. This comes to the core of what needs to be thought through very carefully, which is the cost-benefit analysis. Now, why uh, the cost-benefit analysis is so important? Because it is that uh, analysis that allows you to manage your stakeholders. One thing, Wilson's new to his job, but one thing he's going to learn very quickly is there are a lot of different stakeholders and a lot of different perspectives. Getting that cost-benefit analysis right and being able to frame it uh, for different stakeholders is key. If you don't spend the time framing it for the potential uh, participants, that is one of the biggest reasons why we see PPPs fail. Okay. Wilson, Wilson you, are, you are new to your job, but I want to ask you, what strategies have been most effective in creating new jobs and a new business environment for Sao Paulo? Because remember, what we're talking about here is how to make money. Wilson. Okay. Like a businessman, and uh, our mission in Sao Paulo, one of the, our missions in Sao Paulo business is creating jobs and uh, change the business environment easier and faster than it is. Uh, we believe in entrepreneurship and uh, we are now in Sao Paulo a project to visit the all business school we are working with Endeavor in order to change the mind of the majority of the young to think in create jobs and not only looking for jobs after the schools. And the environment in Sao Paulo uh, is moving to simplify the procedures. We will have uh, simple procedures and uh, more less time to open a new business in Sao Paulo as soon as possible. We are putting our focus in integration with state government and federal government and our main target in the beginning is our doing business. Uh, we need to have a better indication, indicator and we are working for this. Uh, 
I just arrived at public sector and uh, we are putting focus on the solutions and not focus on the problems. Everybody comments a lot about problems, about a very different world, but uh, I, I don't know when I will arrive, but I will only we will stop when I discover. Then in Sao Paulo, we are now uh, open door, a new door to receive entrepreneurs and investors of all the world and the investors that stay here to help uh, more fast and the easier process. Thank you very much. I think we are, the people in Sao Paulo are very lucky that you chose to give up your entrepreneurial success and help the city. Abel, you're from Singapore. Singapore is one of the most successful cities in the world. We all know that. Can you tell us what you're doing and how you're, what you're doing around Asia and how you're making money from it? Sure. And also, I think there's, it's interesting to think about starting new cities as opposed to revitalizing old ones. There must be some challenges in that. What do you think? Sure. Thanks, Barbara. Um, I, I think that um, when it comes to making money from a city, uh, one of the things that what Wilson just said is fantastic is music to our ears because it's part of that transformation that you like to see as an international investor coming into a new location, especially into Latin America. Um, the cities that we've worked on have largely been in the Asian space. Uh, we've done it about five times in Bangalore, we've done, eh, sorry, in India, we've done it about five times in Vietnam, and dotted into China, into, uh, into uh, Indonesia, and, and so on. So our fundamental unit, which is maybe a little bit different from many of the other urban locations around the world, at least in terms of the way we see a city, is that the fundamental unit is not a plot, it's not a city block. The fundamental unit for us actually is a job. And through the job, you know, and I love, you know, I'm glad that Wim is sitting out here in the front because we completely agree that the job is the starting point for the creation of demand. And ultimately that leads to the creation of the virtuous circle, so to speak. From the job, you know, eventually what will happen is that people will say, I don't want to drive to work, I want to walk to work that builds demand for the residential component. Once you have the residential component, people say, I want to party where I live, right? That then it builds demand for the commercial component. And from there, you have the virtual cycle of a living, breathing, vibrant city. And don't take my word for it. I mean, I welcome anybody in this room to come and visit uh, some of the work that we've done in Asia. You can go to the Suso Industrial Park, where we develop 80 square kilometers there. When it first started, it was just farmland. Today, you have a million people that live there, right? You can go to the Bangalore IT Park, uh, which you know, I'm sure that Vim and, and uh, the rest of the Cisco folks are very familiar with. Uh, when we first started with Ratan Tata in, uh, in Bangalore, it was just swampland. And today, you have about 30,000 people that work there every day. And uh, I think that to be able to, to, to make money from a city, I, I like what Barbara said this morning and, and just now, you have to make money, but also do good. So for us as a company, uh, we naturally are, because we are a commercial company, the financial return is, is important. But actually our bonuses don't get paid out until we actually show a differential in the GDP improvement in location. So think of it as marking out the entire location that we operate in and say setting a baseline and over a five to 10 year horizon, the bonuses are then paid out as a result of the GDP improvement. And uh, that's a lot of what uh, we, we think about. Uh, in Singapore, we unfortunately, unlike you know, Brazil, we are not blessed with a lot of natural resources. We don't have an agricultural industry. We don't have a mining industry. We don't have a lot of land. In fact, in Singapore, we actually only have about half of the land of the metropolitan city of Sao Paulo, but the same amount of density. So you can imagine we actually have nothing. So the starting point for us really is always the job. And then from the job, you have then the virtuous cycle that creates a lot of the demand generation that creates the wealth 
ultimately not just for ourselves as a commercial company, but also for the city in terms of tax receipts and then you know, academia and so on and so forth. Thank you. Uh, you. You mentioned transportation for a minute. I wanted to just look at in Bangalore because I have some friends that are bringing the zoo, well, Zoom in Bangalore, but it's Zipcar and other places. It's the idea of car sharing. We don't have to have transportation problems, clogging of roads. We don't get people into buying cars. They just rent car spaces. That's the way you actually look at a city and see how to make it better, learn from the past all the transportation problems and not import them into the future. So it's about thinking about the future in a way that's relevant to today. And I wanted to ask at the end to Harik, I have this question about older people. You know, the world is getting older. People are being retired at 65, but they're going to live till 90. Anybody born today is probably going to live to 100. What do our cities, well, how are our cities going to cope with people who at 70 look like they're 50 and don't want to stop working? And at the same time, we have all these young people that need jobs, and we've been talking about jobs. So I thought maybe you could explain to us how Chicago was doing it and how our cities have a responsibility to our older people who look young and our younger people that need jobs. Excellent question, uh, uh, Lady Barbara. And I think uh, it's very relevant uh, in terms of how the world is reshaping. If you think of the trends that are going across the globe, uh, there are lots of countries, lots of regions, especially in the developed countries, that those countries are aging faster. So their younger population is shrinking. And the number of people that are 55, 65 and beyond are much, it is much larger. So that puts a lot of stress on the government and government has to think the leadership role comes into picture and they have to think from a completely different way. It comes from creation of how are you going to first manage those old people. They are, they are growing. They don't have the skills that are for today's jobs because we think about creating jobs. The jobs for today are different. You gave a great example of, of the airports where you know, people used to be there looking at the passports and the boarding card and now you have machines that does the same thing of the people. How are you going to retrain those people that were doing that job or some other job? So Chicago, especially in the last five years, when we had budget crunch and we had uh, 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 stressed economy, we saw those things happening. What we did in Chicago was we took those people, basically middle-aged people, who are not used to the new age jobs, the computers, the technology, the services, and they were out of job. They were getting unemployment insurance. We kept them on the unemployment insurance, but we started creating batches of people that would come and we would train them in the new tools, the new tools of app development, some easy technology that they could learn and practice. Three days they would learn in class from the people from the industry. It's not the teachers, just the teachers. And for two days, they would go and get themselves immersed into the businesses that they are learning technology. For example, healthcare technology. They would learn the healthcare technology for three days and go spend two days in the healthcare companies that they are learning from to practice those skills so that they can get ready for the jobs. They get paid for the unemployment insurance. They also get paid a stipend, which is, does not disqualify them for the unemployment insurance. But the bigger point is, as people grow older, as people age, there is a stress on the government of making sure that they are healthy and they are, they are able to provide, give back to the society, produce back to the society. And that's where I think the healthcare at a distance, assisted living, all of those things come in. And that's where technology point comes in where we need to make sure that they don't have to rush to the hospital for every minor thing that happens to them. They should be able to be taken care of where they are, whether it's home, or whether it's an assisted living center. So we are associated in a, a, a big a medical city development in central Florida called Lake Nona. It's a 7,000 acre new city that's being built, which is going to be a medical city where we have four research centers, uh, three hospitals, and, and also the whole city is built on a converged network platform. So when you go from hospital to home, you can continue getting that care at a distance. That Those are the things that new thinking is going to be the key, both from the leadership, from the government, as well as from the private sector of how to take care of these people. That's a great answer, and I think it's a very important question. 
Now I want to talk a little bit about how, what is the role of leadership? What is, is leadership at the federal level, at the local level? Who should the, the governor or the mayor be partners with? And how do we make them work together? Who on the panel could talk about that? I can, I can, start, I can start with that. Um, I mean, again, leadership, as I said, is going to play a critical role. First of all, the leadership needs to think through envision. I know you want to talk about what can we do today, but the leadership needs to envision what is it going to be 15 years from now, 20 years from now. For example, uh, Cisco and GE, we in parallel, separately, did a study to understand, you know, what is the value creation of all of the unconnected things that we have on the planet and what is it going to be. So as we see right now, most of us carry two or three connected devices. But that makes up 1% of the total potential connected devices that are 99% of those are unconnected. And parking spots, the street lights, the traffic lights, all of those things, manufacturing sector, the energy sector. So leadership needs to start thinking about what is that, the value that we came up with, close to $15 trillion of value. The city itself creates $1.1 trillion worth of value. So the leadership then needs to understand where is that value coming from. It comes from productivity improvements. It comes from asset utilization. It comes from innovation. It comes from entrepreneurship. So it needs to create an environment where big companies like Cisco and GE and Philips are working with the entrepreneurs local entrepreneurs creating local innovations so that they are creating jobs and it improves the overall economy because all of us in the private sector we cannot make money if the economy is going down we need to get the economy up and leadership has to play a key role in making sure that happens yeah you know, I, I just add two things to that um, I think there are two things happening in cities um, uh, that are being successful uh, first is there is a an ever-increasing need for city leaders to be professional and be professionalised. They're now CEOs much more than, than ever before. Uh, so making sure that they understand the details, the full agenda and are driving uh, for performance is, is now a given. And I think the other thing I'd, I'd add to it is there is need now uh, for real courage and, a, a, as leaders. And, and what do I mean by that? I mean that... Uh, a mayor is elected for a period of four or, or, or five years, or sometimes longer, um, and having the courage to think beyond, um, uh, beyond that to, a, to the future that they want to see. If we look at the really great mayors, the, one that roll, the, the mayors that roll off our town, Giuliani, Bloomberg in, in, in New York, uh, to name two that have, have really shaped a, a, a dramatic improvement uh, in, in a city, it, they really were thinking well beyond. Uh, where they were uh, even able to achieve in their term. And they did it in a professional way and they demanded performance and they knew that they were going to leave office, even if they lost the election, leave office with the city in much better shape on a path uh, uh, that was hard to turn around. That's great. Uh, I mentioned this morning, but we were talking about it before. What about the rule of law? What about the fact that people need to be able to be secure when they invest in a, particularly in new cities in developing countries can we bring money into countries if we don't know that we can be feel good about the courts does somebody want to talk about that sure uh, I'll, I'll take a crack at that Barbara um, you know I, I think that this point about rule of law and being able to provide a certain amount of stability so that you can actually develop and generate a return is very very powerful and it's actually very closely linked to the point that you made earlier about leadership because I think that maybe the best example that I can think of, maybe not so fashionable anymore, is Curitiba. Here, a Brazilian example. And I think many people in the room are familiar with the work of someone like a high millionaire. When he was mayor of Curitiba, what did they do? They actually used a lot of the uh, unfortunate things that were in the city to their advantage. They had no money for a metropolitan. There was no money for a subway. So what did they do? They created the BRT lanes and then connected the rest of the city. What else did they do? They went into the parks. They, they created this, this whole concept of urban acupuncture where they, they created the social nexus that created then a regeneration of the city in different parts. And as a result of that, Curitiba became investable again. And if you look at it today, they are probably the second 
most successful city in Brazil in terms of attracting economic investment into the location because you have the rule of law, because you have the stability of, of the infrastructure and the location, and you have uh, a nice nexus of business coming there. And I, I think that, that that provides some of that thinking, I think, that would be very useful as we think about the cities of the future. I'm sure Wilson can say something about what's happened in Sao Paulo because I see quite a lot of the similar things happening in Sao Paulo as well. Yes. We are building... Uh, the system in Sao Paulo uh, and we are looking for good PPPs it's a there is a big difference between sign a PPP and sign a good PPP for the investor, entrepreneur and for the population we believe in share risks and uh, in have a variable parcel of the payment with good guarantees. We are building these guarantees in Sao Paulo. We have a lot of ideas, a lot of private manifestations of interest, and we are analyzing two or three good priority to Sao Paulo with really political will and big projects with good guarantees and sharing risks and performance measure. measure. We need measure the performance and have two types of payment with guarantees. Can, can I add one point to that, Wilson, which is it's always a balance in this between setting up the right legal regime making sure that you've got the right uh, legal framework and also creating the environment where there's freedom for the private sector to bring in uh, solutions to bear. And one mistake that is often made is that uh, the, the cities or, or, or contracting parties over-engineer the, uh, the PPP preparation uh, such that it thwarts innovation and this morning we heard about the idea of well, we, we, we're using old technology for current problems. Well, the, the guaranteed way to do that is what often happens is just pull out what we did last time and then put it into a PPP. So getting that balance right is absolutely fundamental. If, if, I, could, uh, if I could give two uh, tangential examples. I mean, when we talk about rule of law and the safety of investment, we generally talk about the countries, you know, countries that are unstable and so on and so forth. But then we forget that there are portions or parts of cities in developed countries that are also, that they have big issues. We are associated in uh, a development in Chicago. Uh, Ed Woodbury, our, our partner here, uh, is here. We are, they are developing a 600-acre greenfield city inside the city of Chicago, which is an old established city. Surrounding area is completely poor and underserved and crime-ridden. So we have to think about working with the government on not just developing that 600-acre area, but also making sure the surrounding neighborhood grows and improves along with that. So the investment made in that 600-acre is well worth it. And the same thing applies to London, where you know we were a key sponsor in the Olympics, and we also continued association with the legacy build-out of London, East London. And that's, again, the same, same issue where... As you move every station you go to, your life expectancy drops by a year, and that's not good just because of crime. And those are the areas that sometimes we forget when we talk about the rule of law. We need to think about that too. Okay, can we talk about crime for a minute? Because one of the things that I said in the beginning was that the places that I had lived in, New in America were crime-ridden. One of the things that Giuliani did was to bring in a very strong, very strong police regime. How do we... Is crime the most important part of regenerating a city? What do big events like the Olympics do to help that? Just talk a little bit about how we deal with the, the poorest parts of the city where the crime is the most rampant. Actually, Chicago had the mobs for a long time. How did we clean out the mobs? I just want to have a little word about crime because when you clean up a city, then people will start to invest. Who would like to mention that? Our Chicagoan. Uh, well, I live in Rio de Janeiro, um, and, and I think Rio is a, a really important example of a, a city 
facing a lot of uh, a lot of challenges with the World Cup and then obviously the Olympics, uh, but with crime patterns that were unprecedented. I think we've seen you know the the issue of where you get favelas, large slums, a, a separation that is actually quite close between rich and poor. Um, and, and these fr- friction points that are, are very troublesome, obviously fueled by, uh, by by drugs and theft and and, and other uh, crimes. And I think the, the the actions that have been taken in Rio de Janeiro are interesting, because they're very military in nature. Uh, the UP, UPPs uh, are entering into the favelas and pacifying. I'm not sure if that's a long-term solution. That said. Um, it is having an impact in calming the city and preparing a, 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 a playing field uh, for the events uh, for the events coming up. It is obviously being run by the state. There are jurisdiction issues that need to be played through, uh, and I think we're starting to see a city that's rebounding. To your point, Bamba, that it's it's starting to feel safer. Our families are feeling safer. People are moving in and feeling safer. The number of bulletproof cars uh, that are coming into the streets is well down this year, I saw the other day. Um, All these things matter. And and I think when you have conversations around attracting business to Rio de Janeiro and making sure people are safe for the events, uh, the state and the city have been doing a a very good job. So so as a a Chicagoan, um, first of all, I'm very delighted that you said that Chicago had a problem of mobs. It's, it's a very, very pleasing statement because for years we've been known as the city of Al Capone and we always get associated with that. So it's, it's good to hear that people now think it's in the past. But I do want to give an example, again, going back to London. Uh, I think, again, we mentioned in the, in the plenary session in the morning that crime is directly associated with the overall economy, jobs, and what can you do to improve the, the quality of life of people? And in London, with uh, Prime Minister Cameron, uh, we worked on building this uh, British Innovation Gateway. And that's, again, creating localizing innovation and creating jobs. And we do that at most of the places in Brazil. We have an innovation center. We have in localized innovation. So I think creating jobs and, and lo- letting local people bring that innovation to the fore and giving them limelight, I think, does, to some extent, addresses the problem of crime. Okay. I said that we wanted to have a... Co- Is that the mob shooting us right now? I can't say. <laughs> Sounds like bullets to me, I'll tell you. Okay, so what, what we'd like to do now is to have the audience ask some questions. If you don't, I will, but I already saw one, so thank you very much. Right there, do we have any microphones? If we don't, then shout. Okay, right down here, please. Thank you. Hello. And please say, please stand up, if you Hello. will, Hi. so we can compete with these guys. Yeah. And say your name and what, where you come from. Yeah. Um, my name is Marcelo. I'm from São Paulo. I uh, work with Innovation Strategies for Sustainability. And my question is, we have seen a big stream of crowdfunding and all these projects that's, that come from bottom up. So I would like to know your opinion about that. How do you see, I mean, businesses and local authorities, how do you see this crowdfunding stream as part of city businesses? Like crowdfunding is definitely from a city perspective. What's crowdfunding? Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Marcelo. Great question. So uh, we are talking about projects that are funded by one entity, the public sector or private sector. We are talking about projects that are funded by both public and private sector as a PPP. Uh, but crowdfunding is a project that, you know, because I like something, I open it up on the internet and 50 other people like that idea and they are ready to invest in that. Great. I, I think one of the pioneers of that was the Pebble Watch, where people invested money and everybody who invested money got a watch. And that watch is, does a lots of other things than just the time. But crowdfunding is important for the cities, similar to open data is important to cities. Similar to open data has opened up the city data and freed up to some extent the cities from building apps that the city thinks are, thinks that is good for citizens. It's now the citizens who know that it's important for them to build these apps. Similar to that, crowdfunding, I absolutely agree with you. In Chicago, in fact, I'm on a, a mayoral committee that focuses on neighborhood placemaking and strategy around that area. And we just launched uh, a 
what I would call it a service or a facility which can which can allow the neighborhood businesses to utilize crowdfunding so they can put their idea up on that that the, the website and then neighborhood in that area decides if they want to fund that idea it could be a, a, a neighborhood restaurant or it could be some other place that wants that funding so it absolutely it, it's a great and I think it should be talked more about okay are there any other questions Yes, over here first. Could you so say I'm, your name yeah. and who you it's are? It's Robert Barnard from Youthful Cities. Uh, we're going to be ranking the largest 25 cities in the world from a youth perspective. And I'm interested in uh, the, the idea of youth has been circling around the conference a little bit. And, and Lady Judge's comment about how do, uh, how do cities coexist or how do generations in cities coexist is a very important item and you mentioned how as cities get older that causes problems for governments. It turns out that younger people are amongst the most efficient citizens you can have and if you're running a business you want to attract and retain great customers and youth are some of the best customers you can get. Question for me, for, for the panel though is how well do public-private uh, partnerships engage youth who have the longest term thinking of any citizen in a city and are they doing a great job of, of convincing them that those PPPs are actually good for them? That's a great question. Who wants to answer it? Um, One, two. I think that's a great, a great question. And um, I think in, on the whole, and especially in the PPP context, um, uh, the planning departments don't incorporate you thinking at all. In fact, they don't even engage uh, the, the populace as much as they should in general. I had a conversation uh, this morning with one of the sponsors here, Frog, who was talking about how you actually bring in the experience of, of the service and the city delivery into uh, the decision making. Uh, we don't even do that enough. Um, and, and so uh, I think it is a call, what you're really asking I think is a call to action, which you agree with, which is, which is actually we need to quite broadly think about uh, the populace in the planning process and youth in particular. Uh, because I, I, the point that you make that it's got a long term, the longest term perspective is true, and that also uh, they have a different perspective and a different set of uh, experiences that actually the planners don't even understand. Uh, so it, it, I think it would be best to actually think about that engagement in a whole new way uh, as we think about the planning processes, especially for PPPs. Does anybody else want to talk about youth? Sure. I mean, if you. Do you want to add something to that, uh, Henry? Anyway, so <laughs> one of the ways, uh, uh, I don't know about the municipalities outside the U.S. that much, but uh, if you sample the mayor's office in most of the municipalities in the U.S., you will find 25-year-old policy wonks running around doing policy. So youth is engaged from the public sector side. But pun, uh, 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 that, that aside, I think one of the ways to engage the youth is we have seen, especially uh, we are working with a company called Streetline, which is uh, out of the San Francisco Bay Area. And you would generally associate entrepreneurs with youth. I mean, they are and, and similar to that. So the way we are approaching these big implementations, big implementations in these uh, sort of big cities is going to be through public-private partnerships. And as you uh, redevelop the whole infrastructure, connect all of the infrastructure, unconnected infrastructure, there will be several verticals, whether it is parking management, street lights management, so on and so forth. And then we need to start getting those entrepreneurial companies as part of the overall consortia of the ecosystem that goes and works with the city in that particular public-private partnership. I think that's one of the ways of taking the entrepreneurial spirit, the youth, and then putting them as part of the PPP. Uh, one, can I just make one, one, other, one other point? Um, in relation to Rio de Janeiro that I think is interesting is that um, there are examples in favelas of, of educational groups that started, there's a very famous lady called Dona Ana that created uh, a, a computer learning center in her community and then it started to have youth, youth come together and start to talk about what was wrong and then it started to get a lot of momentum and some really important things starting to come out such that 
it's starting to get a, a life of its own. Uh, so unlocking some of that through social media and some other things has got a lot of power. And I think city leaders, you can't rely on city leaders to do that, and you don't need to. Okay, there's a question right back there. I saw a woman. Uh, my name is Daniela. I'm from Bandeirantes Group. Uh, and I'd like to ask about crime and about jobs. In Brazil, we, we live a situation of a very low unemployment rate. And still, the homicide statistics are growing tremendously. So, if the creation of jobs isn't the solution, what would be the solution? That's really... That's a very interesting statistic. Abel. Yep. Actually, I, I, I completely agree. Actually, in Brazil, uh, last, check, last time I checked, you have an unemployment rate of about 5.5%, which is very, very low. So for me, I think the answer is not in creating a job, it's in creating the right type of jobs, right? In and this plugs into the youth component because ultimately, do you want to create the type of job that the people will be find it meaningful to work in is it and how do you engage the youth right do you have an animation job do you have a game development job do you have a IT startup kind of job I think that to be able to create the right kind of job that's actually what you need to be able to develop a greenfield city because these are the jobs that could go anywhere in the world they don't have to come to Sao Paulo they don't have to go to Mumbai they don't have to go to Shanghai you know these are the, the types of jobs that you want to create in the location that we ultimately decide that we want to work in. And we've been able, rel relatively successful in doing this. We've uh, created a million such jobs outside of Singapore and Asia in the 15 locations that we have operated in. And for us, it's very simple. We work together with the municipality or with the local government or with the federal government and we decide, pass a certain threshold, whether it's a value added per worker or whatever, KPI, key performance indicator, only this type of job qualifies as a job because you know, some of you may be familiar, in Germany they have these things called mini-jobs, which are non-jobs, right? Because they are all part-time jobs, they don't pay very well, they don't have any benefits. And I think that those jobs, in my mind, they're not the kind of jobs that will turn around and transform a city and give you that large-scale change that ultimately you want to see in terms of a lowering of crime rate. So I think we are I'm fully in agreement with you. Okay, okay, there was some more. There's another question right over there. Oh, there and then there. Okay, do you have a microphone? Then you go. Yeah. Hi, my name is Pamela Puhalski, and I work between New York and Sao Paulo on urban development strategies. And from my experience, cities are broke. Cities um, are and broke. Cities are broke. So your point about making cities from money, I hear often, how do we make cities for money? And I want to talk about innovative um, new tools, because Wilson, you're only going to be as effective as the tools in your toolbox. So I'm curious if we can talk about um, expanding the concept of PPPs to engage uh, universities, civil society, specifically social impact bonds, the question about youth, and, and how really we can create these new mechanisms for attracting finance for urban problems. Wilson, did you get that? Do you want to try to answer that question? That's a great question. Thank you very much. While he's explaining the question, I, I, because I think it's important, we have two languages and we're making Wilson talk in English. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry. I'm, okay, Wilson. Okay. Uh, we need, uh, Sao Paulo dramatically need PPPs at the moment. The, the city hall at Sao Paulo. Not only big business, but uh, create jobs with medium and small business. And the concept of private-public partnership in Sao Paulo is we are de developing in this moment. We, we have a lot of people with a hundred of ideas and uh, we need priority, like I told for the best ideas and the good ideas, not only for the investor, but for the populations and taxpayers. Uh, we are looking for great leaders in Sao Paulo that uh, not, not only with education, but uh, really leaders with skills in relationships, and the skills in 
to make a, a good action plan and implement the action plan. We need leaders that achieve goals. Second, in together with the team, do it right, no shortcuts, and all the time thinking in training successors. We need these four things. Achieve goals together in team, do it right, and uh, training successors. I believe in this model and the uh, entrepreneurship here. Okay, there were some more questions over here. You've question. got that, okay. Is this on? Oh. My name is Sean McCon. I'm the chairman of the board of Fundacion Avina, which is a Latin American foundation. And uh, my question is about participation and transparency and buy-in from the community. Um, I also live in Rio de Janeiro, and of course, with all the investment in the city, you see some backlash in some communities that don't see business, private investment, redevelopment as a good thing. They see it as something that's being forced on them. Uh, this, this is common in cities all over the world. Uh, how do you make sure that the citizens have buy, uh, that, that you get the buy-in from the citizens to these pro these different partnerships or other kinds of private sector investments, so that everyone feels like that they're winning with uh, with the uh, with the initiative? So, Sean, uh, um, I will not give example of the Chicago parking management or parking outsourcing, uh, but I'll give an example of uh, when I was in the government. Uh, one of the ways that we approached solving problems was co-designing. And uh, one of the startling facts that came out that the citizens do not understand how governments work, what are the divisions of the government, even to that extent, whether it's the local government's duty, the state government's duty, or the federal government's duty, whether it is the mayor or whether it is the president. So co-designing, explaining to them what problem we are trying to solve is absolutely the key. And we saw tremendous results in whether it was a troubled buildings problem that we were trying to solve or providing the human services uh, in a more efficient way, problem that we tried to solve. Uh, but I think going back to in terms of the public-private partnership, I think I agree with you that there has to be definitely a lot more public involvement in getting the input. And I think you will see more and more of those things happening. One, because the cities are opening up the information, opening up the data, so the citizens would be much more knowledgeable of what is happening, what is the history, what has been the history, and they can opine on what could be the future going forward. And then also there has, not been, there has been a lot more two-way interaction that is happening through technology, either through the uh, town hall forums or anything that is happening, especially in Chicago with Mayor Emanuel. So there will be a lot more avenues where input could be given to, through the citizens to these kind of uh, uh, partnerships. I, I want to ask my own question before we go forward, which is about infrastructure. Some of you people may know that I'm in the pension business and that I've been trying very hard for the UK pension funds to invest in infrastructure because pension funds have long-term liabilities and they can't find any place to put their money because interest rates are so low. So I personally, together with some people in the UK government, are trying to convince the pension funds to invest in infrastructure. It's a long-term problem, but we're getting somewhere. But I'd like to ask the panel, what do you think is the best way to get people to invest in infrastructure? What are some other examples? You can talk about new uh, cities, you can talk about old cities, but there are cities with crumbling infrastructure. How are we going to take those crumbling infrastructure and build it into the beautiful cities that we want? Does anybody want to talk about that on the panel or in the audience? Do you have a, an answer to that question? Uh, do you have an answer? I don't know if there's an easy answer to that question, but there's certainly some perspectives. Um, you, you know, when you... Uh, when you think about investment, um, you've got to have a return on the investment. It's, it's, it's a fairly simple equation from, from a pension fund perspective. Um, and the big uh, issue here is what's the balance between capital and the capital required to set up? What is the balance of operations? How do we think of the total cost of ownership uh, across these infrastructure assets? And what are the reasonable returns? Reasonable returns, uh, not excessive returns, for the uh, service uh, that is that is being delivered, I think the, the the examples of where people have got it right is where 
the, uh, the service is guaranteed. There is an economic basis uh, to be able to do that. And that uh, the, trick for, uh, the, the simplest PPPs are the ones that are closest to the revenue stream, a direct revenue stream uh, that plays into the investment. And I think getting those factors right, allowing for uh, reasonable return and clear social benefits is the way to make sure all stakeholders are, are contented and also very much helps to your previous question around being able to be transparent because you do have no secrets. Uh, uh, does right. anybody else have an infrastructure? And I can, I can give you three projects that you can invest in after the panel. Yeah. Okay, you have a question. Selene Carvalho, sou aqui de São Paulo e da área, I'm in a hotel and uh, restaurant business. And uh, I think, Wilson, you have a huge challenge ahead of you. We are sick and tired of all the promises of mayors and governors and president and nothing gets done. Today, the overhead and, and the expense uh, for a business owner to run a business in Sao Paulo is out of this world. The unemployment, uh, we don't have a workforce. We don't have professionals prepared for anything. That's a government job to train the young people. We don't have any of that. Infrastructure in Brazil was done in the military age. Since then, there's nothing run, done. Uh, the rape situation in Sao Paulo, Rio. Rio is a safe city for the media, but not on a daily basis. Today in Sao Paulo, the, the restaurant business had a, a uh, 35 to 45 less uh, movement uh, in, in, um, in business because of security issues that you're, you're in a wonderful restaurant uh, having dinner and all of a sudden 10, 8 guys with uh, uh, machine guns run in and, and rub everybody and the police is not doing anything. That's the state job and uh, nothing has been done. And uh, to have uh, a, a way of you making money, all you got to do is give the city the infrastructure, give security, and the, the, the regular people will make money, will generate jobs, will do a lot of things. To run a restaurant today, you pay about 70% on taxes and expensive and expenses. And I have friends that now are hiring a transportation to take their employees to, uh, to take them home because the public transportation doesn't work. So it's a huge challenge. And uh, Brazil does not have a problem with money. We have enough money. When you talk about Curitiba, the mayor there, he was an urbanistic architect. He put everything in, 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 uh, that he learned in, in, in action. And since then, there's not one city in Brazil that followed that recipe. And uh, we're suffering and we're drowning here. <laughs> That's, it's interesting. That's why I asked the question about crime. You actually put it, unless you feel safe in a community, nothing else works. Now, I, I haven't lived in New York for a long time, but I heard that starting with Giuliani and then with Bloomberg, but particularly Giuliani, who, who hired somebody? It wasn't him. It was somebody else. But they had this idea of zero tolerance, which I thought was amazing. You couldn't have graffiti. You couldn't have a broken window. The police had a very heavy hand, but they didn't let little things go, go unnoticed. If you had a broken window, that was a crime. If you were putting graffiti on the walls, that was a crime. If you had one shot of heroin, that was a crime. If you start with the little things and you make people believe that nothing will be okay, no small crime is okay, you actually attract the big crime. And frankly, I don't know if that, I, I don't know enough about it. Maybe some of the people here know more about it, but I like the idea of zero tolerance, of making people believe that crime on any level was not okay. Because New York changed. It used to be like that in New York. It's why I left. And now it's better. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. The, the number one action of Giuliani was there would be no corrupt uh, policemen. And there was a lot of work being done there first, and then they moved to the, the zero tolerance too. So corruption is what it's killing us, and our laws are just, uh, doesn't work. 
Well, you remember I asked the question this morning about corruption. I think it seems to me there are baseline things, me personally, that cities have to have. They have to have a legal system that you believe in. They have to have no corruption in the government, not some, none. They have to have a strong police force. They have to keep young people in the working, in work, and they have to keep old people in work. And they have to find some way to finance infrastructure. Those aren't dreams for tomorrow. Those are dreams for today. And they have to happen now. Yes. Desculpa, seu nome é? Selene. Selene. I believe in you. Because, but I believe that is our time. It's time to change Sao Paulo and Brazil. Uh, all my life, I worked as an entrepreneur with a lot of branches in all Brazil and Latin America, and mainly in Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, and other cities with all the problems. But uh, by this, I am now on the other side of the counter. It's my turn. I understand and the, I believe that the price, that the, the people in general and the businessmen that uh, during the, all the life don't interest by politics is every time we will be governed by who interest by this. Do you understand? This is I un, I understand that it's time to move. We have political will in this moment. I am I am surprised as a businessman like others invited by the mayor to move ahead Sao Paulo and move in another direction. We have political and personal will to move. I believe and I respect because uh, my life was in, in this side and I am in, in your side, but in this moment with the, a good intention and a real political will to change the things. And uh, I believe in this moment a lot of uh, new positions in Sao Paulo and uh, a good conversations with state government that the, the crime and the police it's uh, with the government of the state you know, they contracted recently a, a big consultant company and uh, they have now goals to achieve and some, some variables, measurements for this. And uh, we believe in the political will this moment. Wonderful. Thank you. I, I believe in engineers, so I do not believe in Haddad, but I believe that you will get it done. So let's hope for the best. Now, there's one Thank you question. very much. I know from my own experience that when somebody raises their hand a lot, they really want to say something. So we have to get you first, last, okay? Thank you. Hello. Um, this question is for you, Lady Barbara. Um, you, you mentioned uh, a top-down, zero-tolerance policy. Um, what do you think of uh, bottom-up zero-tolerance? I mean, uh, I'm, my co I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Collab, which is a social network for citizenship. And we believe in a bottom-up zero tolerance. I mean, the citizens have zero tolerance towards other citizens committing crimes. Not only crimes, but like that little bad attitudes towards this, their city. And of course, going up to the city management and all the government. What do you think about that? I think it's fantastic. We go to top down because we can't get bottom up. What we really need is for the citizens to demand from each other and from the politicians and from the businessmen the highest and best behavior. And when the citizens agree it, when they don't let their neighbors deal with crime in any way other than they would want it for themselves, that's the confluence. You want the bottom up and the top down. And when you get that confluence of citizens empowering the politicians and making the police behave like police, then you have it right. That's what we really need. So I think this is a very good place actually to end this session. 
What we need is everybody together working towards a better city. You know, I'm worried about older people. This man is worried about younger people. We're worried about corruption in the police force as well as crime on the streets. We're worrying about crumbling infrastructure, but we think PPP may be the way. We look at some of the biggest funds in the world that are investing in cities and technology companies that are helping us to make to be enablers. Technology is not an end in itself. It's an enabler to make people live better. And we're getting the successful entrepreneurs to come back into the government to help make our cities better. Are we not in the best place we could be? We're defining the problems and we're trying to enlist each other to help solve the problems. So with that, I would like to thank our exceptional panel and our exceptional audience for bringing such good questions to the panel. This has truly been a great day, and we thank the New Cities Foundation, John is sitting there, to, for bringing so many people who have such important roles to play in the future, for Sao Paulo, for Brazil, and for the world. Thank you very much.